Jeans Field, 30 miles south of Las Vegas, Nevada. Claudia Jones is a flying instructor and a member of the Experimental Aircraft Association, an international organization with over 100,000 members. Their purpose is to foster technical developments for small craft, aviation safety, and sport flying. Hi, sorry I'm late. I know. Claudia is here to give a flying lesson to 70-year-old Monty Coy. Yeah, so am I. It's a beautiful day. Let's check the leading edge around here. And why don't you catch that bolt right there and I'll get this one. I said, am I too old to learn to fly? And I've been at it ever since. <laughs> and maybe I should say my ultimate goal. I have a little granddaughter. She's 10 years old now. And, and she says, hurry up, Nana, and get and come with that plane so I can ride with you. I suppose that'll be the biggest thrill of my life. Monty is a very dear lady. And she's determined not to grow old. I think that's one reason she wants to fly so badly. In the United States, over 12,000 home-built aircraft are already flying and approximately another 20,000 planes are being built in hangars, garages, and yards. Some enthusiasts take up to 10 years to build their own planes with their own hands. Before these planes are permitted to fly, they are inspected and must meet strict control standards established by the government. This rather odd-looking plane is called a Breezy. It belongs to the local club. Its members built it together. There are about 30 breezies in the United States, and their design is purely for fun. It's not like being enclosed in a nice, safe, secure feeling cockpit. The pilot sits out in the middle of nowhere. It's a feeling of, of openness, such, such a oneness with the sky and the air. Sometimes you even forget you have a wing behind you. You even forget all that airplanes following you because you're just sitting out on a little tiny seat in the middle of nowhere. This is an airplane that you fly by the seat of your pants. It doesn't have a lot of fancy instruments that you can watch. Uh, it's a feeling of exhilaration. You feel the wind beating in your face and the whole, everything looks beautiful. It's kind of like leaving reality. Like Claudia and Monty in Nevada, more and more pilots across the United States are finding that the best thing about flying is the incredible, exhilarating feeling of it, especially in planes they make themselves. Haverford College in Pennsylvania, one woman, Tamara Brooks, has given music a unique place in education. A small liberal arts institution such as Haverford affords the opportunity to study with rigor uh, music and as well study those things which I really believe music is about. And for a student not to have the opportunity to study poetry and philosophy and science and fine arts, the things, the stuff about which music is, I think is a, a grave lack in many musicians' training. Tamara Brooks is a conductor of international recognition. She has led orchestras in Cyprus, Istanbul, and Europe, as well as the United States. With this background, she could have taught in a large music conservatory, but she chose this small school for gifted liberal arts students. Let's take it from four before 30. Don't play the downbeat. Most of the students with whom I work are not music majors. As a matter of fact, it's the vast majority. 
and the quality of work and the amount of discipline and excitement required to do that quality of work is astonishing for a place in which those people are not planning and going ahead with music. I think about uh, their role in the world outside the institution once they leave. Having had such a good experience, having done professional quality performance while they're in school, I think there'll be a different listening audience. I think they'll have a different attitude about what it takes to be a musician than most of their colleagues that go to institutions which don't afford so many people the opportunity to be involved in music. In only two years at Haverford, Tamara Brooks has generated such enthusiasm that 400 of the 2,000 students and professors are now involved in at least one of her musical groups and study sessions. In combination with its sister school, Bryn Mawr College, Haverford now has a chorale of 160, a 45-member chamber singing group, a symphony, and a 40-piece chamber orchestra. This commitment to excellence has merited Haverford's special performances with the Los Angeles and Pittsburgh symphonies. From that section into the, into the first, repeat of the first section, though. Here we are back at Break Forth Into Joy again. Rondo. Down, up, no weight, down again. Up, no weight. It's I don't really believe that anyone teaches. I believe that uh, we do our professional work in full view of people who have like curiosities and we enable them to see what we do question what we do and we challenge them to not follow in our footsteps but find paths of their own to explore so i think the moment at which we're the best teachers is the moment at which our students no longer need us uh, no longer look to us for answers but uh, see us as people with whom they can discuss the questions find that um, a healthy balance in my life between truly professional musicians and those marvelous students who still have the capacity to experience the growth process in a piece of music, to be excited at the end of a rehearsal, to see something change and grow and uh, understand the miracle of that, not just the somehow professional finesse of a performance. That process is extremely important to me. And therefore, working with gifted and bright and dedicated young people uh, is something I don't think in my musical life that I could do without. Campus concerts are extremely popular with the student body. The chorus also performs for local organizations, providing a cultural link to the community. Tamara augments their repertoire of classics by introducing contemporary works, like Robert Starr's Ariel. I believe that it's our duty, as living, breathing musicians, to seek out the Mozarts and the Beethovens of our time, to perform them, to have their music live now, instead of perhaps waiting for another generation or two to discover them in retrospect.
name is Ann Moody Schmidt. She has a master's degree in zoology. For the past three years, she has been the veterinary technician at the Washington Park Zoo in Portland, Oregon. She is a woman very much involved with her work. I think that zoos have two responsibilities, one to the public and one to the animals. We can learn things here in a controlled environment in the zoo that they cannot learn in the wild. I think we have a responsibility to learn as many of those things and do as much for those animals as we possibly can. Larry's picked up a little bit in his feet and uh, seems to be doing real well. Well, that's good because uh, Lauren's always been the one that puts on the weight and Larry has been kind of, well, not really skinny, but he could have always used a little more. Yeah, yeah, he's not a real aggressive either. He's not, certainly not. The special health problems of animals in captivity concern her. It begins with diet. We can't give him the same thing he gets in the wild, but we can give him the same nutrient components, which are the important things. Finding the proper diet for an animal in the zoo is not merely to feed him. It is basic research. With the increased threats on animal environments in the world, the role of the zoo is changing. In the Washington Park Zoo alone, there are 25 species that are endangered. That means they may have no home left in the world. And when an animal is sick in the zoo, the disease may be one never experienced by that species in the wild. Come on. One health problem not found in the wild plagues this new citizen of the zoo. The cement floor of the hippo enclosure was too rough for his tender feet. He is easy to handle. Other animals are not. A tranquilizing dart put this 300 kilo polar bear to sleep. It is hoped that a skin culture will isolate an infection that has plagued this bear. The health of the animals in the zoo has much to do with their psychological well-being. He chooses when he wants to play the game. When he wants to play the game, he pushes a button. If you want to play him, you drop in a dime, and then there's a row of three squares. Now, whoever hits the lighted square first wins the game. And if the mandrel wins the game, he gets a piece of food. A simple reaction time game is part of the work done by the research department of the Washington Park Zoo. Before this game came into the cage, he used to be very aggressive towards the females. Now he pays attention to the machine. He's a lot more relaxed about the females. He doesn't chase them around as much. This particular experiment helps to meet another obligation of the zoo. We try to get a healthy way for people to be able to interact with the animals and get a feeling that is personal for them and yet is good for the animals too. The research on elephants has made the Washington Park Zoo world famous. Pregnancy detection, an immobilization drug, and artificial insemination are some of the projects the veterinary staff has developed. Our zoo is the only zoo so far that has been very successful in breeding elephants because we have the facilities to handle a bull remotely. Every zoo in the country has cow elephants. If we can take semen from our bull and inseminate those cows, everybody can have elephant calves in their zoo. And there's nothing more appealing than an elephant calf. Plus the fact that elephants are endangered in their native country, they're almost impossible to import. So if your grandchildren are going to see elephants, we're going to have to do things like this. I used to think that uh, working towards preservation of endangered species is working for their good. But it came to me one day that if an animal is extinct, if it's dead, it doesn't care. We're the ones who care because we can't see it. So 
working for the preservation of endangered species is really working for people so that they can see animals future generations from now. After obtaining a master's degree in biology and working at a primate center in California, Ann Moody Schmidt came to the Washington Park Zoo. Her first job was at the concession stand. After that, she was a gardener. For a year, she worked as an animal keeper and finally as the veterinary technician. It is not glamorous and its successes are measured in small steps, but it's a job that makes a difference. Maxine Dixon, a successful New York model. Maxine is on her way to her first appointment of the day. Models try to fill in their time between bookings with go-sees, interviews with prospective new clients. A go-see is when a client calls and says that they want to see a certain type of girl when you go over. And you show them your portfolio, and they talk to you, ask you how old you are, and what different things you can do with your hair. <laughs> and then they usually tell you they're going to call you. Since many bookings are made on very short notice, she keeps in constant touch with the answering service and her agency. OK. So uh, same message? OK. Bye-bye. A booking can mean anything from several days at a distant location to an hour in a photographer's studio. Sometimes the photographer and the client will uh, discuss the concept with you. And it makes it easier because if you're supposed to be smiling a lot and being really young, it's, uh, then you know during the whole shooting that you're supposed to keep smiling. Great. A little bit to your left there, Maxine. That's good. Oh, good. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a little higher. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Don't look down. Yeah. That's good. Okay. There's some photographers who will tell you definitely what they want, and that's I think that's easier when they tell you what to do than a photographer who expects you to just come in there and start moving around and not really explaining anything. I'd rather work with a very relaxed photographer. Although Maxine Dixon is modeling makeup in this session, the photographer is trying to capture a natural and simple look. Top? Yeah. You don't see that watch, do you? No. no. A model must have at her command a great repertoire of facial expressions. A little bit more toward the light. Yeah, okay. Lower your hand. That's good. Very nice. She must be able to change emotions very subtly between clicks of the shutter, hoping that one of them conveys the message and sells the product. the photographer's studio, Miss Dixon pursues another interest, riding and showing horses. Well, I grew up in the country. Um, my father's always been around horses, so I was the only one out of nine who really took to horses. And uh, my father is a horse freak, and he's so happy to have me riding with him, and it's really great. I mean, it was a great escape to get back to the country. And I'll stick with horses because I really love it. Dixon has also become a singer with a musical group. Right now, 
They are rehearsing for an upcoming cabaret engagement. We're just trying to get the parts right, the blend we needed. It was very important to get a good blend. So we were going over and over it again to work out the parts. doing that as well as modeling and the horses. I mean, I have a lot of energy, so I might as well put it in a lot of different directions and work at all of them. Whitaker, Griner, Johnston. Three NASA scientists in training. Their goal, a month-long mission in space. Along with a number of other scientific research teams, these three have applied for a space shuttle mission. Ann Whitaker, physicist. Carolyn Greiner, materials engineer. Dr. Mary Johnston, metallurgical engineer. If NASA selects them from among the women who have applied to take part in the missions slated for the 1980s, they could become the first American women to fly in space. They would make the trip in the space shuttle, a new breed of reusable spacecraft now being developed. Unlike existing spacecraft, the space shuttle may be able to travel back and forth between Earth and space many times. In the hold of the shuttle will be a European-designed space lab, a self-contained module with regular laboratory equipment for scientific research. At NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, the three scientists are presently conducting experiments related to the ones they hope to do in space. Well, we're almost finished with a 500 degree soak. For Carolyn Greiner and Dr. Mary Johnston are working together to study the effects of gravity on the solidification of various materials. Their research shows the gravity-free environment of space produces striking differences. Materials that can be developed in space may be extremely unique. There may be no other way to get those particular materials or materials combinations. Before the space program, the influence of gravity on the formation of materials had never been studied. In the gravity-free environment of Space Lab, Johnston and Greiner could compare their experiments with earthbound research. Ann Whitaker's research is primarily in the area of lubrication and surface physics. The behavior of fluids is masked by the forces of gravity. Her research could determine how to lubricate spacecraft for the harsh conditions of a long-term mission, such as a trip to Mars. While the research requirements of these three NASA scientists could qualify them for a space mission, equally important is their highly specialized training. Just as a centrifuge helps the women to study the effects of gravity on a material, a centrifuge helps NASA to study the effects of gravity on women. The women are undergoing training that is as rigorous as the training for male space scientists. Each phase of their training increases their qualifications for a space mission. Pilot training enables them to better understand aerodynamic principles. In a mock-up of the space lab, the three scientists and a crew chief spent five days simulating a space mission. The women conducted their experiments while ground control monitored their activities. The mock-up allowed them to experience firsthand 
the close quarters and extended isolation they would have to endure in the real thing. A jet, flying a zero-gravity arc, creates actual weightlessness for short periods of time. One of the most important phases of their training takes place underwater in the neutral buoyancy simulator, a fish tank four stories high. Having completed courses in scuba diving, they undergo a program of underwater training designed to simulate extended periods of weightlessness. to maneuver about the mock-ups and perform various tasks without the benefit of gravity. Each of these NASA scientists feels that a space shuttle mission is well worth all the training, that their research would greatly benefit from experimentation in space. It's a fantastic laboratory in the sky. We've got things there that we have nowhere here on Earth. We've got an infinite amount of energy from the sun. We've got a vacuum environment that's extremely clean. And of course, we have the zero gravity. But in addition to that, it's a fantastic frontier, one of the few that are left. If all the training and studying and testing pays off, Whitaker, Johnston, and Greiner will spin off into space sometime in the early 1980s. <laughs> 